You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Hi, everyone. We're back with another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Abby Eblen from Nashville Fertility Center. And today I'm joined by my co-host and friends, Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hey, everyone. And Dr. Carrie Bedient from the Fertility Center of Las Vegas. Hello. So before we start, I just wanted to check in with you guys. We have a special guest today who we're going to talk to in more detail in just a minute, Brooke Fault. And she is going to talk about sexual issues during the childbearing years. But first, Brooke was telling us a really interesting factoid. And I've actually known Brooke for a long time. And I was the one that, <laughs> that kind of brought this up. Brooke is unique in that she's the only person I know that has ever been like in the final round to be selected as a Victoria's Secret model. So Brooke, I think that's really fascinating. No matter what side of the coin you are about are on about Victoria's Secret models, tell me a little bit about that. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. Well, growing up, I was always a tomboy, but uh, my mom heard that uh, if you model, you can make a lot of money. And so she thought <laughs> this is a great way to put you through college. <laughs> This is so embarrassing. I can't believe I remember this. <laughs> and uh, I went to Ohio State and the headquarters for all some of those big corporations are in Columbus, Ohio, at least at the time. Uh, so Victoria's Secret, J. Crew, some of those companies. And so it was, uh, they were looking for, for models. And, you know, here I show up in frumpy clothes, now probably my gym shorts or something. And Ended up next thing I know, I'm walking around a boardroom in a bra. <laughs> that escalated quickly. <laughs> Thinking back about that, there's uh, there's some ethical issues with that. But uh, yeah, I, I did. My chest wasn't big enough and I wasn't quite thin enough. And so I didn't quite get that final round. But let's be clear. You are not obese in any way, shape or form. You're And you're like probably what, 5'11 or so? 5'10". 5'10". Okay. Yeah. So you were, you're not heavy in any way. Yeah. At the time I was like 5'10 and um, I don't know, 125, 30 pounds, but that's, that's obese in the Victoria's Secret world. That's insane. That is nuts. I mean, I'm pretty sure my right leg weighs that much. Like how can that possibly be considered obese? Yeah. And then we wonder why women in America have identity issues. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So did you go on and do any other modeling while you were at Ohio State was, or was that the end of it? Oh, this is even better. You know that this is a, a downward spiral. So uh, the best job I got from, from modeling was I became a Jim Beam girl in college, which is totally not what my mom had in mind. <laughs> but this was 20, you know, gosh, 20 some years ago. And I made 20 bucks an hour plus tips. And you give a bunch of drunk guys in the bar shots of, of Jim Beam. And let's be honest, Jim Beam is not the level of like some of the other whiskeys. So I didn't have to dress up in skanky clothes. I had on like cargo shorts and a Jim Beam t-shirt and I just got to walk around with shots. I made bank in college. It was the best modeling <laughs> gig I've ever had. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. That's a, like a lot of my patients right now are do those types of jobs. Because of course in Vegas, the this is prime marketing territory for all of those places. And so, yeah. you know, I... I regret to inform you that if you had ever done that in Vegas, you would be wearing a lot different outfit than cargo shorts. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but that's not bad. Well, especially because in Columbus, because I did my residency in Cleveland and it gets cold there, even sometimes in the middle of the summer. Now, granted, I'm from Arizona, so I'm I get cold all the time. Cold but- is relative to us South girls. <laughs> <laughs> cold, cold is relative. But the thought of being in anything less than cargo shorts and a T-shirt was like, oh, my gosh, that's that's cold. Like, Shouldn't you put on a jacket? <laughs> I actually grew up in Cleveland, well, Overland, 30 miles west of Cleveland. So I know all about that freezing cold weather. Yeah, I mean, it's a great city, but it was freaking cold. I think there's still snow on the ground right now. <laughs> I would believe that. I would 100% believe that. I had a one random question. So I somehow end up being the sex educator in our neighborhood for a lot of our... <laughs> I wonder why. A Gary. lot of the teenagers. I, yeah, shocking, I know. Everybody, <laughs> everybody's surprised on that. But I, um, I normally do all of just the physiology stuff. Like this is what your period is. This is what, it, you know, that kind of thing. But I was just asked for a group of like 13-ish year old girls to do the sex ed talk. Like 
the actual sex, sex ed talk. And I'm like, all right, so I know all the mechanics of this, but is there anything besides the typical, this is physically how you get pregnant. These are the STD or STIs. These are, you know, those types of things and consent, like anything else you think I should be putting in this talk? I think it's so important to understand the terms like body parts and not just you know, vagina, but vulva, clitoris, urethra. I have, gosh, I just had a gal the other day that was 75 years old and she didn't know as her words, how many holes she had. She didn't understand there's a urethra and a vagina that's separate. She thought the urethra and the vagina were together, which they're very close in proximity. And technically the urethra opens, of course, into the vagina, but she didn't understand that differentiation. And so you know, and then she's like, and then I have an anus too, which I feel so stupid, but it's <laughs> so many women don't know those terms. And it's, I think it's important to be able, like when they come to us to describe their symptoms, to understand and be able to use those terms, but also a safety, you know, so especially for younger girls, like heaven forbid, if something, if they were to be um, inappropriately touched, fondled or whatnot, they can specify exactly what happened versus like my down there, or my hoo-ha or whatever cutesy term. Use. That's a good point. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I'll put that on my list. Thank you. <laughs> good luck with that. That's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> All right, Carrie. So you have our question of the day from our listeners, I think, right? I have it this time. Okay. Susan, you go. All right. So our question of the day is because of an autosomal dominant genetic condition, my husband and I will likely be pursuing IVF to ensure we have a healthy baby free of the syndrome. Is IVF easier, different, more successful when it's not done for reasons of infertility? Thanks. So let's first of all define this autosomal dominant genetic condition thing. So autosomal dominant um, is referring to how a gene is passed on. So if you have listened to any of our genetic episodes, um, when we do carrier screening, everybody, what we are looking for is the status of the two genes that everybody carries for any given trait. And so um, when you have these two genes, one's coming from whoever's providing the egg, one's coming from whoever's providing the sperm. And if they're both functioning normally, fabulous. If they're both functioning abnormally, then you have the disease. And if one is functioning normally and the other is functioning abnormally, you're considered a carrier. So when we talk in those episodes, that's all about autosomal recessive, meaning you have to have two bad genes to cause a problem. Autosomal dominant is different in the sense that you only have to have one bad gene to cause a problem. So that means all of a sudden, if one person has it, their children have a 50% chance of having whatever the disease that that gene codes for is. And so it, it goes from being a you know random chance of having two partners who might have the same faulty gene that's hiding to all of a sudden okay, this is a big deal. And it just takes that one person, you know, to have a 50% chance. And so that's what autosomal dominant is referring to. So that's why it's such a big deal for this, this couple, because many autosomal dominant conditions are big, bad, and ugly, and you really want to avoid passing them to your kiddos if you have that ability. Well, the other important thing to note about IVF, I mean, I think certainly if a patient's doing it for those reasons, we assume that probably they're healthy and probably they're going to have a pretty good chance of pregnancy, although age still is important for those patients as well. Um, The other issue is if the patient is under 35, she's probably going to produce a good number of eggs. But unfortunately, about half of those eggs statistically, as Carrie mentioned, are going to be genetically abnormal. And those are going to be ones we're not going to want to transfer. And so it's about quality and it's about numbers. And those issues still apply even in this situation. So one thing we've mentioned in previous episodes, especially in our episodes that we've talked about individuals that are in same-sex relationships, is that sometimes it's hard for those patients to understand and realize that 15% may have an infertility issue that they were never aware of it because they didn't try. And I I think people with autosomal dominant disorders are are often in in the same boat because this is a disease that they themselves have. They're very aware of it. Um, It has probably affected parents, grandparents, maybe even siblings. And so a lot of these people, in my experience, they have intentionally prevented pregnancy for whatever time period. Oftentimes we see these people when they're in their mid to late 30s because now it's like, okay, we're, 
we're secure, we have jobs and we financially can afford IVF or, you know, we're in jobs that have financing for IVF there, you know, they, they kind of have their ducks in a row and it's not like, oh my goodness, now I have to do fertility treatment because we just couldn't get pregnant. It's, it's a very planned out process. And there is a sense of control and understanding that still in that sense of control, there are still things that we are going to learn that we, even with our testing, we may not find out. You know, I always say that IVF is not only therapeutic and that we're helping people get pregnant, but it's also diagnostic. There's some stuff we're just not going to know until we see what's happening in the lab. And so going into it with the awareness that the, just because you're going in for it for that reason does not mean everything will be smooth sailing. It increases the chances that it will be smooth sailing, but realize that, you know, it, it's kind of like building a house or you buy a house and you're going to renovate it. You know, you watch all those renovation shows and it's like, oh my goodness, look, I bought a house that's a hundred years old and the electrical work has to be redone. That That's not a big surprise. If you happen to be in your forties, probably going to have some egg issues. You know, it, it, it's, it's that type of thing. So just going in there with an awareness. And obviously I think this, you know, listener has an awareness, otherwise they wouldn't be asking that question, but it's a stressful thing to go to, you know, it, it, even if you're going through it for that point, because you're, you're hoping you're, you're, you're playing an odds game, you know, you're, you're in Carrie's backyard in Vegas in that 50% of the embryos you create are probably going to be chromosomally abnormal. And then 50% of the ones that are normal are likely to have the disease. And so we usually want to push the ovaries a little bit harder in these situations. We oftentimes counsel, you, you may need multiple rounds of retrievals in order to get the size family you want, just because like Susan said, we know that 50% are going to not be usable because of the presence of that autosomal dominant gene. Plus you've got the age-related aneuploidy. So the, the number of embryos that have an abnormal number of chromosomes in them, that that doesn't necessarily overlap of okay, well, you've got 50% that are abnormal because of the gene and then X percentage based on your age that are going to be abnormal due to the poor separation of chromosomes that just comes with age. And unfortunately, those two numbers don't necessarily land right on top of each other. They can be in addition to. So we often counsel, you know, be prepared to do this multiple times and kind of keep an open mind. Your doc's going to give the best protocol that she can. And is going to learn from the first one. You may need more than once. Um, for your sake, I really hope you've got PCOS and a crap ton of eggs that are just dying to come out into the world <laughs> uh, to make to make all this easy. And on that note, <laughs> I'll introduce our special guest today. And her name is Brooke Falk, as I mentioned earlier. Um, she's with the Women's Institute for Sexual Health here in Nashville. And we're really fortunate to have her here because many of our patients, many patients have sexual um, dysfunction issues. And she's a really great resource to have around. So I really appreciate her coming on the show. And Brooke wants to talk about low libido during childbearing years. And I assume you picked that topic because you probably see a lot of patients with those types of complaints, I bet. Oh, yeah, for sure. I see women of all ages in my practice from 16 on up to, you know, 100 sometimes. Um, and I treat a variety of, of sexual and urogynecologic concerns. However, uh, distressing low sex drive is hands down the number one complaint that we hear in our practice. And while we see it in all ages, the reasoning behind it varies. For instance, in the younger patients, you know, the, the teens and the twenties, oftentimes it's, um, you know, lack of knowledge, lack of experience, lack of awareness of their body and self-pleasure leads them to not really enjoy sex so that they don't crave it. During childbearing years, we know, especially when you throw in fertility, the stress of getting pregnant, being pregnant, if a, a, you know, feeding a child, whether nursing is involved, raising little humans. I mean, it's so <laughs> difficult to focus and to tap into sexual energy when you're so distracted. And women tend to be mentally multitaskers. So our brains are geared towards focusing on 50 things at one time, which is great during the childbearing years, really crappy for sex though, because if your brain's <laughs> distracted, that inhibition that needs to kind of shut off. So you're not worried about the kids. You're not worried about that. Thank you note. You're not worried about baking that cake. You're not worried about work. All that should shut down when you're focusing on sexual desires and it's the distractions can just absolutely kill libido on top of just other stressors. And then moving on into the older years, then there's com complications, you know, as we get older, and women start experiencing dryness or menopausal changes or other health ailments, maybe 
that her partner is having sexual concerns. And so th- what's interesting though is the, the distress associated with low libido oftentimes is in kind of the middle age years, like between 45 and 64. Um, and I think it's because like during the real childbearing years, you know, while it's bothersome, there's so many other things to focus on. Whereas when you kind of move out of those childbearing years, the kids start moving off to college. <laughs> and it's like, oh, who is this person in my house that I <laughs> want to have sex with? You know, and then it becomes bothersome. But it's still, you know, obviously bothersome enough. I see patients all day, every day in the childbearing years that um, that come to me. And sometimes it really is just a conversation. It's not always something that we necessarily treat with medical intervention, but um, you know, in some cases, if we, if I'm talking to a patient and they've really put in effort to um, work on those modifiable factors, for instance, you know, maybe the kids keep barging in, so they put a door, a lock on their door. Um, maybe they they have a really bad partner, and so you know, sometimes separation is a more appropriate answer. Sometimes they have pain. You know, there's just so many explanations, and if you can identify that and either rule them out or manage them, and they're still bothersome low sex drive, there are treatment options available. So I have a question, Brooke. So how often is it due to a true hormonal condition? Because I have a lot of patients who'll say, well, can you check my hormones? Think my testosterone's okay? And you know, for women, we kind of have lower testosterone anyway. It's kind of hard to know what the range of normal really is. So how often do you see people that really have issues related to true hormonal problems? Yeah, that's a great question and perfect timing because so women have about a 10th of what men have with testosterone. It's still a very important hormone. And yes, it does drive sexuality for both desire, arousal, orgasm. However, a, a consensus paper actually just came out and I can send that to you, Dr. Evelyn, um, on how and when to use testosterone in women. And right now we still do not have an FDA approved testosterone for women, not because we don't have evidence on safety and efficacy, but rather the last company that went up before the FDA, they had a patch, I believe it was called Intrinza, and they had about a billion dollars worth of research into their studies and, and everything that they presented And while the safety and efficacy appeared to be pretty positive, the FDA said, okay, that's great, but we want five more years of data, which was going to equate to another billion dollars worth of research. So unfortunately, they just didn't have that funding. They shut down and all research in the U.S. just kind of took a back seat. But this new publication basically addresses like basically how and when to use testosterone. And what we know is that, yes, younger women certainly can have low testosterone, even for their age category. But testosterone replacement seems to be most efficacious in the peri and postmenopausal years. So for a younger patient that comes in with, you know, sometimes I will look at their testosterone, usually related to contraception. So certain oral estrogens, especially synthetic estrogens, can cause a rise in a protein called sex hormone binding globulin. And it basically binds up testosterone, renders it useless. And so the symptoms of low testosterone are related to an outside factor. Hmm. So changing their contraception or whatever is causing that can sometimes be the treatment versus giving them testosterone. Um, But usually if a younger patient comes to me, I'm not checking blood work. You don't have to run hormone testing for the most part, but in my patients after like around the time of peri and postmenopause, in those cases, sometimes I'll check a testosterone, I'll check a sex hormone binding globulin, and a dihydrotestosterone. And those are the three key um, numbers that help guide, kind of guide me on when and how to use testosterone. And then do you monitor it like as you go along? Because you know I've had patients, fertility patients who have gone places, not to you, I'll mention, but have gotten <laughs> testosterone pellets put in them. And nobody that I'm aware of really monitors their testosterone or really even check their testosterone beforehand or... Or ask if they're trying to get pregnant, which I've had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So by the way, if you get a pellet, you, you need to wait probably six months before um, before pursuing any type of pregnancy, ideally. Um, but yeah, we uh, of course, we don't fully know what happens if you're receiving testosterone injections, pellets, creams, anything like that while pregnant. Obviously, this hasn't been specifically researched, but we do know that you know, as you guys certainly well know, elevated levels of testosterone can certainly impact the the growing fetus. So anyway, um, I don't typically do any type of like pellets or anything like that because female patients, you know, if you we're, we're all so different with absorption and how we respond, we're a lot more sensitive than our male patients. So I work in urology. We do tons of pellets for the men. We have tons of research. We have FDA approved options. We know how and when to use them. Um, And men do great because they need huge levels of testosterone. Well, when you put a pellet in a woman and you don't know how they respond to testosterone, 
they certainly could do fine and feel great and, and not have any problems. But oftentimes I see the train wrecks that come to me. There's a path of no return. Like a beard or something. <laughs> they've got facial hair. Their voice is low. They've got acne. They're angry. I had one woman and she goes, I was literally wanting to walk down the street to just go find a neighbor to have sex with. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and so it is scary. I think maybe in the future, there will be a time and a place, but 100% for a patient that is wanting to get pregnant anytime in the near future, I think it's a terrible idea. So I have what I call my keeping up with the Joneses question. So for our women, 25 to 45, which is our main kind of age group that we see, we'll have couples who come in and, you know, the quintessential question is how much sex is normal? (laughs) Because, I mean, I sit there and I read histories of people who every single person who comes in One of the questions is, how many times a week do you have intercourse? And I can say what I see in my childbearing population is a whole heck of a lot lower than what the general population thinks is actually happening out there. So what's what's your insight? Well, the, the research that we have to date is usually twice a week is average. However, that, of course, is taking into consideration a wide spectrum. So certainly, I have patients in my practice that have sex once every month or once every two months, and they're fine with that. And then I, I had a patient one time that came in crying, and she and her husband, she was like, we used to have sex six times a day, and now it's only once or twice a day. What's wrong with me? And I was like, <laughs> I didn't get anything done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. I was like, it's probably life. You're trying to probably do other things now. But uh, no, it's just, you're right. It's that perspective on what's normal. And then when you have partners, you've got two totally separate personalities that have a different sexual appetite that also have, you know, a different opinion on what's normal and what they want and, you know, what they crave and how they do it too. You know, I mean, there's just so many parameters that, that go into this. Yeah. And so sometimes sexuality education or sex therapy can be really helpful when there's that kind of disconnect on reasonable number of times. So I feel like this is a thing that I see the most often is that a couple comes to see me and the biggest question they have, and you can tell that they're trying not to bias me with how they're asking the question because <laughs> like both of them get the same kind of, you know, outward appearance, facial expression. They're like, okay, we need to ask you how much sex should we be having? How much is too much and how much is too little? Because And I see most often it's husband wants to be having sex all the time. Wife doesn't and wants to like funnel it into this one five day window period. (laughs) Um, Or, or sometimes you do get the reverse where the husband's like, oh my God, I am so over this. Because of course, if you're having sex on demand, that's, that's a job. That's not a pastime. (laughs) Um, And so how do you deal with those couples that have not only different drives, but have the different fertility drive where they're trying to figure out what do we do and how often do we do it? And there's big trauma between them as a result. Yeah. And having worked in infertility a a while back, you know, I have a unique perspective and I, for my patients that come to me that are either in the midst of fertility or about to, or having recently gone through fertility, um, I I feel grateful to have that perspective because I used to see that all the time. Um, I even remember having one patient that went through fertility simply because of lack of sex drive. She's like, I just can't have sex enough. (laughs) I don't want to. And I think she had some pain too, but it was really kind of eye-opening. But that's where I was saying like sex therapy can be really helpful. So I'm more the medical side of things. So for patients, they come to me, I'm trying to, to find a biological explanation for their symptoms. I cannot function in my practice without my sex therapy colleagues. And, um, and oftentimes it just takes this unbiased opinion to come in and say, listen, you know, let's, let's break it down just like you would with any marital concern or relationship concern. Um, and just being able to have those conversations. So it, the other thing too, I know that probably all of you work with counselors that are um, familiar with fertility and experience with fertility patients. Sometimes that can be helpful as well. But in my case, I'm not a, a psychotherapist by any means, but I certainly do a lot of psychotherapy. Yeah, that's what we say too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And just normalizing that, I'll just explain to patients. I'm like, you know, listen, this is a common complaint. You're not alone. And sometimes just that simple phrase, I just see people go, okay, good. Because like you guys said, I mean, it's just, there's this misrepresentation of like, 
how other couples are out there just having sex wildly and it's so easy. And it's not. Women are not designed to enjoy <laughs> penetrative intercourse the same way that men do. So with a heterosexual couple, it's it's definitely a bit tricky. Um, but then there's the, also the, the difference between how much sex and how enjoyable, how pleasurable is the sex? And, and not just physically, but also emotionally, spiritually, you know, that whole connection. And that's where in some of the clinical trials, because we actually have two FDA approved medications now for premenopausal, so women before getting to the point of menopause, childbearing years, women with distressing low sex drive with no other modifiable factors. And in the clinical trials, they found that these medications didn't necessarily increase the frequency of sex but rather the quality of sex. So instead of, let's say we've got a heterosexual couple, a male, a female, uh, let's say the male partner wants to have sex five times a week, the female wants to have sex twice a week, um, but because the male partner wants it so often, the female partner never gets the opportunity to desire it or to initiate it. And so what they found in the clinical trials is it shifted where women were initiating more often, um, but the number of sexual, uh, sexual encounters maybe only increased by a few. And so it's really difficult, as you can imagine, to measure sex, you know, especially when you're in a clinical trial like that. But uh, but it was kind of eye-opening over the course of the last decade or so as some of these publications came out. Now, I'm assuming that medication is probably not something that's advised, though, when you're actually trying to conceive, because I'm guessing there's something in there that we would probably have some issues with. Am I correct? Yeah, that's a really good point. So there's two FDA approved medications right now. Hopefully in the future, we'll have more for, you know, men's sexual issues. We have about 30 plus medications and hormones and things like that. So we've got two. But anyway, um, there's one called Addy. Flybanser is a generic of that. It's a daily pill. So you have to take it every night at bedtime. Takes anywhere from like four to eight weeks, depending upon the patient's response. Um, it works. I, I hate to use the, the comparison to depression, but you know how for patients with mood issues, they take a medication. It doesn't work immediately. It takes a while for it to kick in. But instead of working on serotonin, which a lot of the mood stabilizers work on, this works on enhancing dopamine. Hmm. So it's real specific. It's kind of similar to Wellbutrin, but a little bit more specific in the sexual health realm. So at about eight weeks, women start to notice that they have more sexual thoughts and fantasies. It works in about 50% of patients. And in my experience, it either works really, really well. Women say it's like this light switch went right back on or it doesn't work at all. So it's kind of hit or miss. But for fertility patients, a daily pill that you have to take for two months, if you're in the midst of a fertility treatment, you think you might get pregnant, you're not on contraception, those are bad times to initiate something like this. Something that might be a little bit more appropriate at that point would be something called Vilesi, which is the newest agent on the market. The generic is called bremelanotide, and it's a melanocortin receptor agonist. Um, also works by enhancing dopamine in the brain. Uh, but it's an on-demand. So it works within about 45 minutes and lasts upwards of, in my experience, like 16 to 24 hours or so with my patients. Um, again, it, it's kind of 50-50 with regard to efficacy. It's fairly safe. The biggest side effect is nausea, but because it's a, a short-lived medication and usually it's pretty mild and transient, it usually goes away after that first injection, um, can be used intermittently if you know for sure, again, you're on some form of contraception or preventing pregnancy or you know, for sure there's not a potential for getting pregnant and you're not in the midst of fertility treatments. So it's a daily injection? No, it's on demand. So it's kind of like the concept of Viagra, except Viagra works by enhancing blood flow into the genitals. This works on an on-demand enhancement of dopamine in the brain. So guys, get a pill, we get a shot. Right, I know. That is not fair. I'm, I'm still thinking we're getting the shaft here. The way I was thinking about Susan, guys get a penal enhancement, we get a brain enhancement. <laughs> <laughs> in both cases, emphasizing what you got. <laughs> so Brooke, I have a question. So if, if it's not a hormonal issue and thinking in terms of our infertility patients now, if it's not a hormonal issue and you know, you wouldn't recommend taking medication in those patients, what are some behavioral things that you recommend for your patients that would be applicable to our patients with infertility? So good question. Um, men tend to, and again, this is a general statement, but men tend to be uh, driven by that intrinsic desire to release sexual tension. We as women tend to be driven by uh, tapping into our physical cues. So for instance, as physical arousal begins to happen, we become subconsciously or consciously aware of it. And that drives us to want to continue that experience. 
that can occur from our partner saying something really nice to us or watching erotica or reading something romantic or thinking about a past positive encounter. Those are all cues that the limbic part of the brain processes and can subconsciously lead into physiologic arousal, which can be the genitals, the nipples, whatever is the more erogenous area. Um, but as that again occurs, arousal happens before desire. So it's, I don't want to say it's rare because women can certainly have spontaneous desire, but generally it's a more complicated pathway. So because of that, women have to be a bit more intentional about prioritizing sex. And I hate to say that because <laughs> it's frustrating, you know, for a woman that is, you know, going through fertility, might have small kids at home, either working inside or outside of the home. You know, there's just 50,000 things. And then to say, oh, by the way, you also have to focus on thing. this other thing. It does oftentimes become a chore. And so um, getting creative, you know, even you don't have to spend a bunch of money, but just taking time out, having somebody watch the kids for, you know, a period of time. Um, if uh, during fertility treatments, if a patient is noticing that sex is becoming, like you guys mentioned, um, you know, a chore or it's becoming monotonous and forced, maybe taking a month off to just kind of enjoy things and just have spontaneous sex, don't monitor your cycles. I know that's not always reasonable for everybody, but getting creative with location, positioning, just simple positioning, bringing in, you know, romantic novels, reading to one another, just changing things up oftentimes can be exciting and new to the point where it, it enhances the experience for both partners. Those are some great tips. Well, ladies, any other questions that you guys have for Brooke? This has been great. I could probably go on for a while, but I think our time is almost up. Any other thoughts? No, those are fabulous ideas. Thank you so much. Because this is something that we all hear all the time and don't necessarily have great access to getting people into somebody like you or or your team. Um, and so it's always be helpful to be able to get some perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. It's been fun. Yeah, this is great, Brooke. Thanks so much. And to our audience, thanks for listening and tune in next week for more. And be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. We'd really love to hear from you. You can also visit fertilitydocsuncensored.com to schedule an appointment with any of us or submit any specific questions you have about infertility. All questions will be answered anonymously on our Ask the Doc segment. So don't hold back. Uh, the more the better. All right. We'll see you all soon. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye. Bye.